I wouldn't go into business with a friend. Like it was pretty heavy. Was he like down. a really good friend? Yeah. And I'll never talk to him again. What are the things that you, as the person hiring, is looking for? Number one thing is don't have a shit resume. If you're trying to be a graphic designer or a filmmaker or someone that requires aesthetics, and you have a fucking word template, I close it. I don't read it. I close it. Done. Done. He was in thongs. <laughs> and he just <laughs> to a job interview. Okay. Yeah. He didn't give a shit. I'd be pretty much in tears in my car before I would like go, Mom, I need 200 bucks. Like, I hated fucking doing that. That was the worst. When my boss, the owner, says it needs to be done, I'm not going to snap at him. That's my job. I get it done. Salud. Salud. That's actually pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the podcast that still doesn't have a name. Uh, I don't I don't think I have told you that. The podcast still doesn't have a name. That was my first question to you. Yeah, I was going to make, make you pitch me the podcast. <laughs> I'm basically leading by example, showing people that you should do more than just talk or mm. th or even just think. So basically, I'm just doing and figuring everything out along the way. But basically, you are the second guest of the podcast. Unfortunately, you weren't the first one. Um, That's all right. At least I'm the best one. Yes. yes. But ladies and gentlemen, creatives, entrepreneurs, today we have a good one. Today we managed to get some time to speak to one of my favorite humans on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. He is the brand manager of Evolve Skateboards a six foot four Australian tall content creator and filmmaker. Please welcome Matty Rogers. Cue the music. Yeah. Thanks, Matt, for the beautiful intro. Much welcome. appreciated. Welcome to the podcast with no name. How are you, brother? Um, yeah, pretty good. What are you doing? Where are you posting it if it's got no name? Um, well, it'll be on YouTube, Spotify. Well, on Apple your podcast. like personal YouTube? The no not on that one, no, like there will be a specific YouTube channel dedicated to this podcast, but gotcha. once there is a name, it should be, there should be a name soon. I have a couple ideas, but I don't want to spoil it just in case. But Maddie, for people that have no idea who you are, poor people that they don't have you mm -hmm. in their lives, I'm it's very unlucky. lucky to have you in mine. Um, could you give us a brief description on who are you and what you do? Yeah, look, I've been sort of working in the digital media space predominantly. Started with film anyway. That's definitely where my roots are for about a decade now. And then I'll, for the last four years, I've been at Evolve Skateboards, which is the pretty much the industry leader globally for electric skateboards. And I'm the brand manager over there. So I got like pretty much yeah, oversee all things branding, social marketing, and that sort of stuff. Um so that's the short version. Before we jumped into in your role and everything you have learned working for a company like Evolve, can you tell us a little bit about your creative journey? Because previously you were a freelance filmmaker. Mm. And my hope with this platform is to help a lot of creatives, a lot of entrepreneurs, but especially like creative entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and filmmakers. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey as a freelance filmmaker? How did you even get started? Did you went to film school? Yeah, I mean, but it really started before that. So like if you take it back, the first time I picked up a camera was probably when I was 14. So it was I was a kid, you know, in high school. There was a local guy at the time. I was 14. He was a bit older, maybe 17. His name was Alan Hardy. And he was making um, all these cool like bike videos, sort of like a cross between Jackass and like Krusty Demons, Nitro Circus, extreme sports stuff. Us in Cairns too. We were all up in Cairns. And I'm like, oh yeah, I could do something like that. So I took mum's camera and just, I was an avid mountain biker. I took it out to the trails and then just started filming mountain biking. And then fast forward maybe two or three years, I, I kept doing that. And then this same bloke ended up getting a job for unit clothing and he moved down to the Gold Coast and didn't age well. But at the time, unit was a bloody 
cool company and I thought this bloke was just living the dream. <laughs> so that's sort of what inspired me to know that it could be a career because mm-hmm. someone that came from a similar background in the action sports from this small town up north, he did it. So I'm like, I can do this too. I, I went to film school from then. So first year out of school, went to university. It took me a while. I had to like transfer and do all this other stuff, work in odd jobs in the bar. But by the time I, I'd finished film school, I was fully self-sufficient as a freelancer. So I didn't, yeah, pretty much like from second year in uni, all my money was coming from film. And then it was just a bit of a wild ride from there on because the way I've sort of gone through this creative industry is not sticking to one discipline, if you'd say. I've had a bit of a, a wild ride. What do you mean by not sticking to one discipline? So I definitely started in filmmaking, but I wouldn't by any stretch call myself a filmmaker. It's like I can do it. But I'm probably as much of a filmmaker as I am a photographer or a, mm. a, a graphic designer or a f- whatever you want to call it. Like I can probably do all of that, but it's not my forte. I think nowadays I'm much stronger in like the overseeing of marketing campaigns and brand management and actual mm. branding. But to get to that stage, like I said, I've been working for a decade and I've gone through so many different avenues to learn all these different things. So... It's not like I did my film degree, I started a freelance company and I've built it up for 10 years straight. That's mm. not my journey. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'll definitely have to go through like a bit to get there. How, how were you getting clients back then for, for filmmaking or even photography and things like that? A shitload of free work, pretty much. I shot, and keep in mind, I was quite young. So like, How old were you by then? I went to uni when I was 17. Mm-hmm. Like... Uh, Yeah, I was almost finished first year by the time I turned 18. Um, So I was always had the attitude that if there was ever the opportunity to go and film something or go to class, I would go and film something, even if it was free. I did a lot of work in the mountain bike scene, the uh, BMX, motocross, wakeboarding, all those action sports because I was passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And just by doing that and posting it back on YouTube, this was... 2011 i was doing this wow so people were sort of watching yeah Yeah. um probably a bit more intently um got some good contracts like that went to like i got jobs with tourism um queensland when mountain bike events were up so it was pretty good i hadn't learned the business side of it at this stage but it was enough to sustain myself at the time um and then i ended up getting tied up doing three four five i don't even know i don't think about it in merchandise and i did a lot of e-commerce and marketing around clothing essentially you went to film school um you finish a film and then you become a freelance filmmaker slash photographer graphic designer you're doing jobs here and there and then you had a a clothing company right that i i remember that it it was like a really big thing in your journey. Can you tell us about that story? Because I think there will be lots of lessons for entrepreneurs in oh, there. A lot of lessons in that story. Like, okay, so up until the stage I was doing that, I, I didn't have all the other skills. It was predominantly just film. Like I even remember, oh, I'll get to this, but there was a guy that had a streetwear company, again, we were all young. It was nothing. It was small. He sponsored a rider, gave him some shirts that I hooked up with. <laughs> Hashtag sponsor. <laughs> that I hooked up with to make an edit for this company, but I didn't get paid. He got a couple of shirts. Like it was real grassroots stuff. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the concept was there. Like, and like I said, that guy that was my inspiration at the start, he went to unit. So, I, he was doing this on a big scale. I wanted to be like him. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm like, sweet. And I started doing lots of content for this. And it got to the point where, like, this guy couldn't pay me. I ended up taking share of the company. Mm-hmm. So, I, I got a little bit of the streetwear company. And we were pushing that for, like, I can't even remember how long this all went for. Um, let's say over a year, we got into a warehouse. It was growing. And then we decided we were going to start import 
importing blank clothing at a wholesale level and going direct business to business. And then honestly, I spent at least a year like almost in sales. Like most of the days I was on the phones like trying to freaking like sell t-shirts and it was good for building up those skills. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I had to learn how to do the graphic design for emails and I had to learn how to do photography. I remember the first time he said, go do photos. And I'm like, oh, no, I don't do photos. <laughs> I had a 5D. It was a photo camera. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, but no, I don't do photos. I don't do photos. <laughs> and, and then I took it. I'm like, oh, that's easy. <laughs> okay, yeah. I guess I'm a photographer now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of challenges in trying to do a business like that when you're pretty green to it. Like, I was like 21, 21 years old at the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, we turned over in a couple of years. Like, I think the first year we did the wholesale one, we did about 350 grand in revenue. Holy shit. It's pretty good. Yeah. Like for a bunch of young kids. Yeah. Like we spent a fortune. And that's, that's split 50-50 or? No, that, well, that's revenue. Yeah. So, so not profit. No, yeah. not at all. It's yeah. fuck all profit. Yeah. <laughs> um. But the point of it was that you had to just keep buying more stock because the only way you could sell a million dollars is if you Mm. bought enough stock. So it was just money going in, money going in. At the time we were doing that, I was was paying myself $250 a week. This went on for two years. My rent was $220 a week. I'd be picking up the odd film job to try and subsidize it. It was all bullshit. Um, Like, how hard we were working and not really getting the return. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of that was because of inefficiencies. We didn't really know what we were doing. What kind of inefficiencies? If I did it now, like there's a lot smarter ways to do lead generation and um, like maximizing how, how much money you're going to get out of a client. And lead generation is like my big thing now. Like I used to literally like go through websites and try and call people and like we jumped in a car and drove to Adelaide and back and stopped at every shop on the way. I'm like, I wouldn't do that now. There's yeah. definitely... <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound like a really smart way of doing but it. Man, turn it, turn it look, to be fair, we were just having a crack. We were doing the best yeah. we knew and we yeah. learned a lot of skills along the way, but that it just all ended quite awfully. <laughs> so what, what happened? Like uh, you guys are working really hard. You are, are working on the uh, lead generation and all these things. What happened? Look, we were sort of gearing up. We knew that we needed more money if we were going to scale. Um, and then he, my business partner got tied up with this business mentor who spun a whole bunch of stuff. And long story short, we just didn't really see eye to eye. Um, a few things happened behind my back and I couldn't work with him anymore. So, yeah that ended very abruptly and i took a bit of a loss but it was it was what i needed probably to move on to the next stage because i wasn't enjoying it either like i'm not a sales guy like i didn't Mm want to be sitting there doing sales so Mm -hmm. yeah what what did you learn from that experience about business partnerships (laughs) so i've always said i wouldn't go into business with a friend Again, like it was pretty heavy. Was he like a really good friend? Yeah. And I'll never talk to him again. Like it was pretty like real heavy. So I wouldn't do that again. Um, And as I say that, I've just gone into business with another friend. So it's a bit different though because of Mm -hmm. how that went down. But I definitely have more accountability and more like, like I need to view more of it because like I did a lot of trust and I'm like, you do that side, I do this side. I wouldn't do that anymore. If it's your thing, you need to have a lot of sight over what's happening in your own business. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just better to do it by yourself. Like equity is sort of number one and then loan money or pay money to get the right people involved. I would definitely go down that route next time. Yeah, and the actual model of business, I wouldn't do it that way either just because small margins and all that sort of stuff. And then with the legality of things, because like in the end, from what I remember of the story, like you just got pushed out, out of the way and you didn't get to keep anything from that business. What would you do differently 
to be protected against something like that again if you went to business with someone um look i don't want to go into it like i don't want to dwell too much on the past mm. we the way that it went down i could have probably like done some legal stuff but we're fighting over nothing like as i said it's not like it had a huge amount of profit it's not like and it wouldn't have worked like if if the two people running it can't work together what's the point of like fighting over to get it back together um i mean i left and then the thing closed down without me so like yeah i don't i don't know definitely get it all set up properly like the new one i got is all contracts and trusts and mm -hmm. goes through an accountant and everything's legitimate on paper mm -hmm. strong strong communication before you go into any partnership don't be a f even if it's your friend don't be afraid to be blunt because like if you don't say something because you're worried then there's miscommunication so like the one i'm in at the moment like i just have to like be upfront if i'm thinking it i'm gonna say it like i'm not trying to like however you feel about it doesn't really matter let's just talk about it and we got a good understanding there now so yeah communication is pretty key after this happens like i'm guessing you went through a, a really dark period mm -hmm. in your life um try to guide us what what happens after you're left with nothing with your business you've been working in this for a couple years now and now you're back to square one what's what's happening yeah i'd say it got pretty dark for like like the last maybe year or six months that i was still doing it like even before i got fucked over it was like it wasn't what i wanted to be doing like it wasn't me chasing bikes around it wasn't me making cool films or doing cool photos or doing adventures so it wasn't what i wanted to be doing and then the stress of not having any money that's like a big one for everyone mm -hmm. so that was very tough for me because i hated asking for help so like my wife who was my girlfriend at the time Like she definitely helped me out a lot. And then my parents as well. I'm lucky enough that they did, but I'd be pretty much in tears in my car before I would like go, mom, I need 200 bucks. Like I hated fucking doing that. That was the worst. Um, so going through that for like six, 12 months before it actually all went down, the negative feelings there were more like a sense of betrayal. I guess, mm -hmm. um, but there was also a sense of I get to do what I'm going to do now and mm -hmm. I get to move on. So that was sort of positive. I ended up sending myself, I, I went over to California by myself, got a van for three weeks and just literally drove around in circles in the desert for three weeks just to sort of like clear my head and reset, figure out what I was going to do. And then I came back and pretty much from then on, it's been on the like constant up mm -hmm. so yeah definitely like yeah i don't know there's hard times in there did you went back straight into freelancing after that yeah well funny um i i ended up taking the biggest client from the company because we were doing a lot of like helping brands um make their stuff mm -hmm. so i had the relationship with this guy i said look let's go do this um and then straight away that was enough to support me like straight away and then i picked up a few odd bits and pieces with you know darren i was working with him and storyboard and app um doing a bit of work there And I did that for probably... Darren is a good friend of us. <laughs> yeah. Side note. <laughs> I did that for probably, yeah, nine months or so until um, I decided to move down to the Gold Coast to really reset. Mm -hmm. And then when I came down, that's when I found Evolve. How did you find your job with Evolve? It, it was online. Like, it's the first job essentially I ever had because I always worked for myself other than when I was a bartender. Mm -hmm. Like I'd always work for myself either freelancing or doing the merchandise or clothing thing. Um, 
and then I wanted to buy a house, but it's a lot harder to buy a house as a freelancer. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, sweet. If I can get myself a little paycheck, it'll be easier to get the mortgage. Looked online, boom, skateboards. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this is this is me. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Walked in there. The what was the main role uh, they hire you for? They didn't really know. All they knew was that they'd never had in-house marketing before. Mm. They were paying a company to make them YouTube videos and they wanted someone to make the YouTube videos cheaper than they were paying the agency because mm. they were putting them out weekly. So I think it was like, I can't even remember what the title was. It was like... YouTube in-house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was like, it wasn't even a manager thing. It was like a creative video person or something like yeah. that i don't don't know what it was and mm. i mean it wasn't like paying a shitload or anything like that but it, it sort of was what i wanted mm -hmm. and then they were really like lenient with what that role actually was and once i had all this experience past um filmmaking at this stage more on the branding side of things and the social i pretty much took over like a pretty significant part of the business um and then yeah just kept rolling from there and then we're hiring people under me to just keep going and going and going and now there's four or f four or five people that work under me in the marketing wow, team that is crazy so yeah it's changed a lot since yeah. since i started yeah that's just, awesome it's good um how has your role changed now that you have people under under yourself because at the beginning it was you doing absolutely everything when it came to the creative side of things so now that you have people that you have to manage and things like that how how are things change in that sense yeah that's a big change like i i have a video editor a graphic designer web developer a content writer um and i mean they they all sort of need the guidance of where to go like what's going next um most of them have been there quite a few years now so they have a good idea of the the feel and stuff so the work mm -hmm. they do is great but my job is definitely a lot more on the guidance side of things now than actually jumping into premiere and editing a youtube mm -hmm. video and doing mm -hmm. this and this I, ju i jump in and do bits and pieces mm -hmm. um i'm still the only guy that actually shoots the content but other than that i'm not editing stuff anymore so it's a big shift and it's not something i did before too mm. so it was learning on the job um luckily i got one person at a time you know i just started with who did we start with i can't even remember i think it was a video editor it might have been the web developer but one person at a time so it's not like i had to jump straight into doing a team it was it built up What are the biggest nuggets you have learned of dealing with managing creative people? If you could give advice to entrepreneurs or business owners that have to manage or deal with creative people, what are the biggest things you have learned? I think creative people need to find passion in what they're doing. They're able to do it if they don't. But one of the biggest wins I had was this editor who's grown up, like he just gets it. He's from a similar background to me and grew up doing bikes and skateboards and stuff like that. So required a lot less management from the start because he was so invested in actually making it awesome. Um, other advice in managing people? I feel like I'm pretty um, relaxed. As I'm relaxed in most areas of my life. Mm -hmm. I haven't really had to be too gnarly with anyone because everyone steps up. We're a small business and a small team. Like right now, we got a Black Friday sale starting. And I mean, the web developer is probably going to have to pull a 16 hour day today. Mm -hmm. But it's no questions asked. That's part of the gig. He's doing it. So it's, it's good choosing people at the start that you know are going to work out. And that's the hard bit, probably the hiring process. Yeah. Um, as a as a business now with the experience you have, when they first hire you, you're like a jack of all trades, right? You could do video, you could do graphics, you could do photography, you could do marketing, all these things. But 
at what point should you start specializing? At what point should you start getting someone dedicated for a particular task? I think it really depends on um, the situation. I think the industry plays a big part of that. Like electric skateboarding is not a big scene, right? If we were the same size company, if we were the biggest person in mountain biking, we would have 100 people on the on the marketing team. Um, if we were in mining, there'd be a 1,000 people. So you have to manage costs with what you're playing with. Um, for us, it was important pretty much to stretch everyone to the point where not that they're going to break, but that there's there's a big list of stuff they have to do and they can't get it done and they're working hard. So for me, I'm like, I could if I had an editor, I'm going to shoot twice as much because I'm not going to be editing. Mm. All right, we're going to put out twice as much content and we know right now that video content is very important. Mm. That's the point at which we're like, okay, we can justify this editor. Um, and sometimes it might be... There's definitely conversations like do we get in a senior person that can work well and fast or do we bring in a junior that is cheaper but they need more guidance. That's more of my time which we're trying to free up. I think you really just got to like weigh up how much cash you have to do this and what is the actual return. What are the things that you look for in someone that is applying for a job in a company like Evolve. Like if, if I was a freelancer and I really want to work with a company like Evolve, what what are the things that you as the person hiring is looking for? Number one thing, if you're going for a job as a creative, is don't have a shit resume. I cannot stress it enough. If you're trying to be a graphic designer or a filmmaker or someone that requires aesthetics and you have a fucking word template... I close it. I don't read it. I close it. Done. Done. Um, like honestly, I can't stress that enough. <laughs> when I when Can I you expand in that, what do you what do you mean like by having a nice resume? Okay, so I was like, say we look for a video editor, like maybe six months ago, a year ago, um, and I got 180 applicants. I don't have time to read 180 resumes, so I open it. And the first check is visual. So like, I'm going to look at your resume without even reading it. And if it's not like getting me in, if I can't see that you understand design or what looks good, because that's going to be your job, it's it's a no. Like it's thumbs down and I don't actually read it. And I just, I feel like a lot of people are going to have to do that when they're dealing with 180 resumes. Um <laughs> And I couldn't believe it. We hired a graphics designer three or four months ago. And there was people that could not graphics design the template. I'm like, if you can't do that, how are you going to do my shit? It was ridiculous. Um, other than that, it's it's how much you want the job. So put some effort into the, the cover letter. Um, make it tailored to that job. Actually look into the company. That goes an awful long way. I get that people don't get a lot of jobs, so they might have to apply for f fucking 100 of them, and that takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. But if you actually go the extra distance to care about the job, like I had a, I had a Facebook ads manager, and he, he actually had an Evolve, and he sent through his resume the first time, didn't mention the Evolve thing or anything like that, and it was just another resume in the stack. I'm like, eh maybe whatever put it on the short list with another 20 people he followed up with an email of a video of him skating on the skateboard and talking about what he knew and i'm like okay like a this guy gives a shit enough to go out and do something extra he's thinking about the job it's not just an application for the sake of an application and he got the job like he backed it up in the interview but i think getting noticed is going to be a big thing and if you're a creative Visual is so important. Yeah. It almost works like like a YouTube thumbnail, right? Before you even look at the video, you're looking at the thumbnail and mm -hmm. the title. That's what gets you in. So it, it'll 
be the same for a resume like make it aesthetic as as you can but then also have a a good cover letter and then add on top like the awesome work that you're able to produce right? yeah obviously the content like you can only you you don't want to lie on the resume you can only say you're as good as you can say so frame it as best you can there's a million like templates and stuff you can use i mean you can get away with the canva <laughs> resume if you want yeah. um but yeah just don't have a word document i don't think are you looking more for skills or personal traits skills is number one like you have to be able to crush the job so when i shortlist it's pretty much based off off skills and then if you don't fit what i think is going to be like a cultural fit it doesn't matter about the skills so we've had a couple guys come in especially for like web developers and stuff and it's like these guys are fucking weird like and it's just not going to be good cohesion and then you're not going to get the same sort of communication and output that you're going to get out of someone that you're really gelling with but i'm not going to hire someone that's cool if they can't do the job yeah. have you had to fire someone so far no no and with specifically that the video editor the one that you're still working with because it seems like you've been quite happy with him in the past i think over a year now that he's been working with you yeah yeah like it'd be 18 months now what got him the job specifically to that role i actually had three people coming in for that interview and if i had to sort of tally them up in the order that i thought would get the job he was going to be the last one i didn't think he was going to get it i didn't quite understand anything about him he is he didn't portray himself as what he actually is um and then most of the films he'd done was actually for his wife's production company which was very female focused like he had to send me a 45 minute documentary about women talking about their relationships with their clitoris <laughs> Because that's that's a body of work he had as yeah. an example. So, here's my here's my portfolio. That's what he had to do. Clitter is documentary. Yeah. yeah. So that was that was wild. And then yeah. like the guy that had the fucking awesome, awesome resume, awesome showreel, everything was great. He came in and he was super creative. He he kicked his shoes off in the interview and he put his feet on the chair. He was like, he, no, no way. He was a Brazilian dude and he came in from Byron. He asked us if if he could put us on a probationary period to see how like he felt on the inside with that much driving. Like <laughs> no way. would it be good for it? Like I'm all for mental health, right? <laughs> you no, no, I'm like, like, are you serious? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. He was wearing a tank top. I just got the vibe. I'm like, he doesn't give a shit at all if he gets this job. Yeah. Like <laughs> his work was great. Yeah. But I'm like, he doesn't like he doesn't Wait, he care. actually took his shoes off? He was in thongs. <laughs> <laughs> and he just to a job interview, okay. Yeah. Um yeah, he was just like a Brazilian surfer living in Byron Bay. Like he didn't give a shit. Yeah, um, that like how could you even think that you can get a job doing that? I, I yeah. It's beyond me. Like his work was great. Like he was such a good filmmaker. Um but also, all his work was, like, at a high-level agency. Mm. So, it's, like, these guys are working with, like, you know, $100,000 budgets and probably, like, fucking four months to punch out a video and I need a video every single week and then yeah. I need videos on socials so that I don't think the time frame of what he did would sort of align with what we did where um, Mickey, the guy we ended up going with, just like I said, he just got it. He came from a background of BMX. He understood skate culture. He understood um, going quick to market. He understood like what actually looks good because that's important, like the maneuvers of the body. Like mm -hmm. if you put someone that's not in any sort of sport, extreme sport, you can't tell what's cool and what's goofy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's important. Um, and then his work ethic, once we actually got him in, he, he was very fast and thorough. And good. 
has he ever snapped at you? Because you you have put a lot of pressure to him He's a, a few times. Like, has he ever been like, fuck you? Like, you're, you're breaking me or something like that? Nah, he's a sweetheart, eh? I, I felt like yesterday I pushed him. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> well, it's like he's just had a... Well, his wife's just had a baby. So, like, their life is turned upside down at the mm-hmm. moment. And... He was supposed to do some stuff on Saturday for me because he couldn't do it earlier in the week. And then he couldn't do it on Saturday because his wife's got tonsillitis. So he's looking after the baby. So I call him on Monday. and He's like, oh, the wife's out. I am looking after the baby. It's all chaos. And I'm like, man, I got to like four o'clock. I need this stuff. And he told me he could get it done like after. And I'm like, I sort of need it by four. Eh? And he's, he just said, I'll get it done. And he got it done. And that's happened every single time. So hiring people that do that Mm. is what I'm all about because that's what I do. Like when my boss, the owner, says it needs to be done, I'm not going to snap at him. That's my job. I get it done. Yeah. Figure it out. Like, yeah, and that and that's the tricky yeah. thing, right? Like finding the people that has the the work ethic, the hunger, and and the willingness to to exceed expectations, right? Because mm. skills you can always teach someone. I can teach someone how to make a great video. You know what are my secret techniques or or whatever, but. I can't teach someone, you know, the meaning of hard work and and just just having that that good energy as well when when days are stressful and things like that. Because I've gone, I've been going through this process in the past months. You know, like uh, I've been hiring someone to help me with video editing and BTS and hiring even other people to just test how that works. You know, in a video production business and just to be able to understand what's the next step when it comes to scaling up and it's it's pretty tricky you know and and then it, there are things that to me are normal you know I, i'm you know me like i'm i'm a hard worker i love getting after it. i've been hustling for six years this creative passion after i quit dentistry you know just starting literally from scratch and you know finally we're getting to a point where things are getting much better but now it's like okay i need to start hiring talent what are the things that you look for, you know? So I've been educating myself a lot and and trial and error as well, like hiring someone. And then when they have to spend a full day with me, it, it was funny because, you know, like you can see it sometimes maybe on my social media or when I talk about it on, on, on previous podcasts or things like that. Like, yeah, I, you know, I work this many hours, you know, 12, sometimes more than 14, 16 hours a day, you know, what depends on what's happening. But until you see it and, and you experience it, you, you don't believe it. I think, you know, even I remember this editor that was working with me, he came for like, trying and things like that and he's like oh what time i should be there i'm like look i'm i'm working since 5 a.m so pretty much uh, you can come in at any time and he came but at, at that point we have a bunch of projects going on and he you know like i had to teach him a lot of the the process with some of the stuff that we're doing and things and things like that um and then you know we finished our, our, around 5 p.m he's kind of looking at me you know and uh I'm like, yeah, look, like, like you can leave up any time. I still have work to do, you know, and I kept going. And then he came for like the next two days and it was exactly like that. Days that we just need to sit down, get after it. And, and you know, the, we go to the toilet and, and have food and that's it. Back to work, you know, it's very. And he told me afterwards, like, shit, you really do this, you know, and I'm like, well of course <laughs> well, what were you expecting if i don't do it nobody is gonna do it for me you know especially as a as a business owner you you have to get after it you have to be willing to you know do more than what most people do because i think the easiest thing you could actually do is get a job you know if you get a job you have certain specific times of when to work you know exactly what's expected of you you know as long as you bring i think it's really not that hard to get a job if i really wanted to get a mm. job today oh yeah it depends on the job i think i think it takes more to succeed as a creative in terms of i guess effort because we're we're outputting a product at the end of the day Mm -hmm. and you have to be proud of 
what you put out mm. like or, or you have to know it's acceptable that whatever you put out is representative of your work mm -hmm. if you're in like customer service or something like that it's it's probably not quite the same thing mm -hmm. like within our business like um definitely like the creative team what well, they do they work harder than a lot of the other stuff like you, you we knock off at four we start at seven seven or eight or whatever four o'clock like whoosh, like a bunch of people the warehouse people fucking out of there like they're not passionate about their job yeah. fair enough like they're <laughs> they're younger they're fucking stacking boxes on shelves and stuff yeah, like that yeah. but whoosh, they're gone creative team still there and i think to be a creative whether you're working for someone else or doing it for yourself it just comes hand in hand that it's going to take more passion, more effort. You're mm -hmm. putting part of like what you, I don't know, what you believe, what you think, like whatever you're putting out, the product is representative of you. And if you're not putting the work in, you're just going to kick yourself that it's not good enough. Mm -hmm. And if you're not doing that, like you're probably not going to make it because people will realize, they'll see, like it's not the sort of job you can just coast in. I think. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And in you you can also tell like what you're saying, like you can tell when someone is not giving their hundred percent in a particular thing when it comes to creative stuff. And it's hard because you have to deal with revisions, you know, whether it's for uh, with a client or your boss or your coworker, you have to get used to people judging your work, you know, and, and telling you, you know, oh, this wasn't as good or this could be better. I don't think there are that many jobs where you get judged that much, you know, where you get a lot of revisions mm. and things that need to be changed. And sometimes because there's a lot of uh, subjective things, right? Like colors are uh, a, a particular angle a particular effect a transition a, a decision in the storytelling and things like that you know then the the music so that are not really mistakes it's just subject unless you really suck at it and and then you're like and it just yeah, this this is just trash you know <laughs> but but yeah i think i think that's one of the biggest hurdles as a creator like getting like understanding that you have to detach from it and understand that any, every critique or revisions and things like that are just going to make your work better. Not all the time. Sometimes, you know, you just have to make your client happy as well or even your boss. Sometimes I have, it, I have to do changes for, let's say, a video that I completely disagree with. I think it makes it worse. I think it makes no sense or I think it, it just doesn't look good. But that's what makes my client happy. In, at the end of the day, they're the ones paying you. If it was your boss, you know, He's paying you, so... Oh, you got to yeah. pick your battles. That's what I exactly. found. Like, my exactly. boss is, like, a super passionate guy. And, like, I feel like anyone that's had a lot of success and can be in the position to be your boss, there's definitely an element where you have to respect them yeah. anyway. Because it's like, all right, he's got this far. Like, even if I think he's wrong on this particular thing, like, unless I really believe it deeply, like, I'll only fight a handful of things. The rest of it, I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll concede that he knows what's up here yeah. or that it's just not worth um, the fucking back and forth about. So, pick your battles on, on those ones. I had a mate actually that he had a vinyl wrapping business. He wrapped cars and he printed up a sign for his own shop and it just said, yes, we could do it like that dot 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 but it would look like shit <laughs> <laughs> sometimes clients don't know what's up yeah yeah, yeah. so I, I think it's also that's where communication comes in as well like i have had a lot of instances in which a client might come and say like oh could we actually change this scene for mm. this and then you know like you, you explain to them look the reason we made this decision it's because this, this, and this. And if you have a, a, a strong, you know, base of why you made certain decisions and you actually think it's critical to the the final result, then, okay, like, 
communicate, explain everything. And then if they still don't agree with it or, you know, they, they just simply don't like it, like literally, like you're saying, pick your battles, just mm -hmm. let it go. Let it, yeah, doesn't matter. That's fine. That's sort of, you touched on it there. And that's one of the biggest challenges I've personally faced in growing a team underneath me is the need and to have a good ability to communicate ideas, communicate what you want, because like, oh no, like in my head, like for years and years, I just do it, right? So like, I didn't ever have to explain it to anyone because I did it. Now, you know, I'll have a graphics designer and I'm like, oh, I need this. And in my head, I know exactly what it is. And the poor girl's looking at me like, <laughs> like, tell me, <laughs> like, t t tell me real clearly. Yeah. And it, no, it definitely is an art actually being able to explain that and articulate mm -hmm. that. So I think that's, um, if you are looking to get someone underneath you, keep in mind that from the start that they're probably not going to understand your vision unless you explain it. It's very simple, but it's very important. I've yeah, come I, up against that quite a lot. I, I completely agree with that because I've run into that myself with, mm. with the editor that I've been hiring. You know, sometimes I see it so clearly in my head, but I almost don't give enough information I and I completely forget it. Sometimes uh, I'm explaining it and I'm like, this is a shit explanation. Like, <laughs> I'm, like I'm, I'm doing terribly at explaining <laughs> yeah. what I want. Yeah. <laughs> so this yeah. is, it's my fault. Yeah, yeah, completely. Um, but yeah, it's something I'm working on. Yeah. And something that I came across as well is that you have to, when you can't hire the best talent, you have to be very patient as well. Cause you like, there are things that you probably as a, you know, hustler or, or someone that has been doing this for so long are natural to you at this point. There are things that to me, when it comes to video editing, for example, are very logical and natural. And it took me a long time to learn, but I completely forgot about it. You know, I, 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 you just forget how hard it was to you to get to the stage and all the mistakes you made before you were able to pull an, an edit that you can, that, like the ones you can do these days and you know when, for example i have my editor doing some stuff and then basically he he was meant to cut some videos and start almost doing the foundation for me to come up and polish and and do like all the final details of it and then i come to do the edit and i'm like wait why did he do this why did this is done this way why is this you know it didn't make sense in my head i'm like why do you do all these things and then i had to relearn like yeah true okay i like i've been doing this for a long time i have mm -hmm. to teach what are the faster processes of, of doing things you know and i, I think as a just a, a side note as a creative like learning how to be fast when it comes to things like editing and stuff like that will help you so much you will get so far ahead by just being able to to do stuff quick by learning your shortcuts by learning how to do you know if it's even something as simple as cutting a clip like how do you do that with just one click instead mm. of doing two you know that's one of my favorite things about mickey my video editor the man is freaking fast yeah like yeah. The amount of content we put out because he's so much faster at editing than me like if if we lost him and i had to edit again it's like the amount that our output would <laughs> go down by is extraordinary because i just can't edit anywhere near the speed he does yeah um, and that and that's how special it is to get someone that specializes on that particular thing also you're you're paying for it you know like yeah. this this guy's you know in his 30s like he's been doing this a long time he's freaking good and he, like he's got options to do whatever work he wants because he's good whereas we looked for another role and the ceo was sort of like it sort of makes sense to get this role. Like I said before, like you have to balance up what it's actually worth to the business. He's like, it sort of makes sense, but not really. We'll probably have to get someone part-time. We're going to need like an intern or a junior or something like that. So I go out and I get that. And you can't expect what the other people are doing that are getting, you know. It's just you have to know what you're getting, like you said, 
and I knew that was going to happen. So mm. it was the output was really really slow. I'm like, that's fine. At least it's something I'm not doing. Yeah. It just took five exactly. times longer. But over time, that person's going to build up and get better and better and better. Probably going to cost us more as they get better and better. But that's fine. The business will grow to the point where we can justify Do that. It. Yeah. yeah. Um, you're in direct contact with the founder of Evolve. Like you literally report everything to him and, and you have a great relationship with him. What are the things that you have learned from him? Because he, he's a very interesting person from what you have told me and like he built this massive business out mm -hmm. of just his passion of, of riding yeah, yeah. skateboards and surfing and things like that. So what are the main things you have learned from him as a CEO? Yeah. Well, first one is that he's not the CEO and that's quite important. I'll get to that in a sec. Mm. The whole thing started as a passion. Like he built an electric skateboard because he wanted an electric skateboard. He went snowboarding, came back to the Gold Coast, couldn't get his endless run in. So what's he going to do? Figured out this electric skateboard was about the close to snow as he's going to get. So the business started from a point of passion and, you know, you hear that from like the Gary V's and stuff, how important that is. And that pushed him through like all that hard work. Man was working so many hours, still works so many hours because he actually gives a shit about what he's doing. He cares about the product. He cares about how it rides. He cares about what the customers are going to say when they get on a board. Um, yeah, the... The shit, just I can't emphasize how much passion he has about these skateboards after 12 years. He freaking loves it. Like, he'll call me up on a Saturday morning because he did something else to his board and he's like, just wants to talk about how it's riding. This is a dude that's got a freaking huge business. Um, so that's important. And then back to the CEO thing, he quite quickly built. A business where there was better people than him at the certain tasks we hear this a lot as well so he he was never an accounting sort of guy so he he brought in a guy quite early on to be the ceo to run the money side of it to run uh grants logistics shipment that sort of stuff so he could better focus on the product or um you know getting systems in place so we could deal with distributors around the world like stuff he was more passionate or more needed in he would free up his time there by hiring. He was running the Instagram for seven years until I came along. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it wasn't good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. It wasn't good, but it got to that stage where it's like he didn't have the time. He couldn't afford to do that stuff anymore. So, you know, got someone in like me to do that. We got in every part of the business now has someone else running it so he can focus on the only thing he actually cares about which is the ride so that's probably one of the biggest um takeaways is follow something you're passionate about and then when it makes sense um get someone that is better than you at a certain thing around you to help build it um Yeah, and just have fun with it. It's about the story. We always talk about that because we get to travel around the world quite a lot. And I like I don't know how much of an end goal he has. He just wants to make it bigger every day and have fun while he's doing it. I feel like that's his goal. Do you how do you create that culture, you know, of, of passionate people? of hardworking people like you mentioned like he's still putting a lot of hours when probably he doesn't really have to um how do you create that culture of evolve you're super hardworking. you're super passionate about this job as well um how do you create that culture for the entire company um great question i think it's actually really difficult to do and something that almost happens organically I've been there four years and there's been like a bit of like quite a bit of staff movement um, and the company's grown quite a lot. As things get bigger, uh, it's going to be harder to do that culture. I mean, at the stage we're at now, like we have to have like accountants and like logistics people. We need, you know, some people that deal with our operations in China and these 
to find good people there, they're not they're not going to be skaters that want to go drinking on a Friday. Mm. So not everyone's going to fit into some super culture. Um, but back to the the hiring, I think it's just people that you can communicate with organically and enjoy it. From a, your job currently, mm-hmm. lead generation. Lead generation is like my favorite thing in the world. How do we get clients, Matthew? Mm. Why, how do we generate leads in this well, day and age? That's that's the number one question, right? Because everyone's doing all these like weird methods, um, but it's chopping and changing so quickly that it's hard to like give an answer that's going to be relevant in six months. The pretty much like my big one is incentivize signups to start with to a targeted audience. So that would mean identify the sort of people that could be your clients. So for you, you're looking at people that essentially own a business that needs media work. For me, it's um, someone that might like to buy an electric skateboard And I know from previous data, they're a 25 to 40 year old man. They have a bit of income, they have a bit of spare time. They're a tradie or a professional. So I'm targeting those people. Uh, The easiest way to do that straight off the bat is Facebook lead generation, which they can actually allow you to do now without doing the whole sign up form. Like Facebook has a function in the ads where you can have a form that doesn't take them to a website. You put in all your details there. And what I mean by incentivize it is I'm giving away a two-hour shoot at the end of the month. Just give them a reason to sign up. And once they sign up, educate them about what you do. Like all you're trying to do is get the lead so you can educate them on why you're a good fit for their needs. And I think there's a fair bit of understanding that goes into that. Like... I'll make you a video for 2000 bucks. Not good enough. Why? Like, why do they want that? Why do they need that? Do they need that video you're trying to sell or do they actually need 20 stories for telling their stories and then they can make highlights and you can do the graphic design on their profile on Instagram? Do they need someone to go in and set up their TikTok? And like, what do they actually need? And then hit them with that. Um, Facebook ad... Facebook ad leads is the easiest first way to do that. And then from there on, um, as, as other platforms to do it, um, there's some more sketchy ways to do it with like, <laughs> what do you mean a sketchy ways? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's actually like plugins and stuff you can get for Chrome, which scan Instagram URLs and take emails out of people's profiles and then, <laughs> is, is that uh, legal uh, um, well okay it's legal it's legal to email them once you can't put them onto a newsletter right <laughs> okay so this is not something i do for evolve it's something yeah. i've done in the past um but it's it doesn't cost much money you use like a not one of the main email programs there's other software that will do it to drip feed emails but if you scan like back in the day i was scanning Um, Instagram, it was essentially Instagram.com slash username. And then they had to have an email in their profile that I could collect. And then they had to have like two or three keywords or two of three. And I would go like fitness, brand, gym. And then I'd start getting all these fucking emails, like a list of 5,000 emails from Australia of they were either like personal trainers or something to do with a gym, like then you chuck them on this thing that sends out 20, 30 emails a day. Hi, I'm Nelson. I can make this content, blah, 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 blah. You got 5,000 emails. You're going to send, you know, 20 emails a day for the next six months automated and you're not even thinking about it? One in a thousand replies. I don't know, whatever. But it's lead, lead generation. Then you're doing the Facebook ad thing on top of that. And then you're working on um, referrals from existing customers. That's a huge one because it carries more weight than like a cold audience Mm -hmm. thing. But if you're doing all of these, you're getting all these people coming to you. And that's, well, that's marketing really. 
you need people coming to you. Yeah, the, so the last guest I had on the podcast is a, a marketing expert, and he said something that has been stuck in my head, and that is basically that, because for example, for Vibes Creative, my video production business, this year has been the biggest year we have ever had, and it has all come from networking and word of mouth, mm -hmm. like literally everything, networking, word of mouth, but I understand that in order to get to the next level, I need to start doing marketing and double into SEO and all this stuff. Yep. Um, and he said, you know, like word of mouth is not predictable, which that's no. what you get. Was this guy in paid mouth. ads? In both paid ads and non-paid. Okay. So I have, I have this whole theory at the moment. It's a bit of a conspiracy theory, but <laughs> I think paid ads is almost a load of shit. Like I know I just said to do it because it does work to a degree, mm -hmm. but the business model of Facebook and Google is to claim leads and sales. It's in their best interest to claim that it was their, yeah. them that people that came you to you. Yeah. So you're not selling a product online, but we're selling the Facebook. So uh, we're selling the skateboards. If say someone, say I put up a TikTok organically, it goes viral, gets 200,000 views. They're like, what the hell is this skateboard? Let's go and look at it on Instagram. And then they watch a bunch of our podcast shorts and they're like, oh, like I'm actually getting that. Um, cool. And then because they did that, we retarget them on Facebook with like one little Facebook ad that they watched three seconds off. And then they're like, oh man, like, go back, watch some more TikToks, whatever. I'm going to buy one. Goes on to Google, types in Evolve Skateboards. They're coming for us anyway. They typed in our name, but they clicked the ad because it's not the top. Now they've seen the Facebook ad and they've clicked the Google ad. So Google's going to claim that it was yeah, Google yeah. sale. Facebook's going to claim it's Facebook sale. If you take the revenue from what Facebook said and what Google said and what Clavio, the email program said, it's like two times your actual revenue. Like it doesn't, it's not completely trackable because they're all lying because it's in their best interest yeah. to claim as much as possible. Exactly. And the way things are going at the moment with like TikTok changing the social game is that organic content, especially short form videos, is the best way to reach cold audience because the algorithm will let shit go viral more than ever before, especially on TikTok. Reels, like you could put out a reel and if it hits, get 200,000 views and that's all called a cold audience that starts looking at your stuff. If you were to go and do ads to get 200,000 views, it's costing you like hundreds of dollars. So proper utilization of organic is also key for um, lead generation or just brand awareness. Awareness. Without, I think a lot of companies are leaning heavily on just, we'll just make creative and we'll just pay for Facebook ads because digital agencies are pushing that because mm. they'll give you this nice spreadsheet or a nice dashboard where they're like, we 12X your money. Ah, it's all a bit of a load of shit. It'll all unravel soon, I think. How much does a company like Evolve spends a year in marketing, in paid ads? A lot, six, seven figures. Yeah, it's a lot. Are you planning, since you have this theory, are you planning on cutting those expenses or? At least trialing it, yeah. Like I would, it's just a big risk, right? Because let's say, let's call it half a million in ad spend. If we were to cut that completely, while, you know, Facebook is saying, you know, it's a 5X return or a 10X return, that's $5 million. <laughs> Like that's essentially the risk you're taking is by like saying, cutting. I don't believe Facebook. I'm going to risk not making $5 million in yeah. revenue. It's a bit of a big risk. <laughs> like we're not obviously going to cut 100% of it, but I'd like, I'm definitely interested next year to see what happens with the the growth of these other platforms and the the ability to reach cold audience and taking some of that money and punching it into better organic content mm -hmm. and more organic content mm -hmm. rather than just relying on a platform to reach everyone like it's not like it's not a secret apple ios 14 has blocked a lot of the data that instagram and facebook is mm -hmm. able to see same with google like 
it's it's just not what it was five years ago. That's not an opinion. It's not as good. Um, so yeah, we'll see what happens. But so what are you doing instead? Okay, you're cutting a a, a bit of your spending in paid ads. Mm -hmm. What are you doing then to generate those leads? What are the the action plans? We're taking that money and punching it straight into organic content. So sure like just because you're spending a hundred thousand less on paid ads doesn't mean you should not spend that hundred thousand you should reallocate it into a different form of marketing where you think is going to get a better return for me i think that these short form videos that go viral is better than a cold audience like look like fucking ad that goes out to a million people because the point of these platforms is to show it to people that want to see that sort of stuff that's what tiktok is like make a video and then they want people to watch as many videos as possible they will find the right person mm. um and then once people are interacting like that keep giving them the good stuff educating them about the product and then hopefully they're going to move down like more of an organic funnel rather than a paid funnel to the point where you can get them on a lead generation campaign get their email start really educating on on what they need to know about the board and then yeah hit them with finance and <laughs> buy the stuff <laughs> yeah bye yeah um if you had to start a business let's say i give an example with a video production business because you have experience as well in it what will be uh, the steps that you will take in order if you have to start from scratch you do have your skills so you already know how to make videos mm -hmm. you already know how to edit um you already know how to create deliver a great result what will be the steps you will take in order to get a uh, clients i would as quickly as possible, make it look like I was as established as possible. So straight away, I would buy, I would do a website real quick. doesn't have to be super crazy. Mm -hmm. um, a landing page, a contact form and about me. Just make it look legit. It's not that hard. And then I would go across. Sorry, let me do. That's my web developer. <laughs> Can uh, Let me take this because yeah, yeah. I did tell him to call me. Yeah. Hey, mate. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> so that phone call is a good example of small business because it's like almost 6 p.m. As I said, that's a web developer that's working on the site until late tonight because he fucking gives a shit. Like that's his baby. Yeah. But also like there was a question where he needed me. So calls me up. <laughs> and that's just that's how creators work like yeah it's non-stop hours Always don't really on matter call. Man, my boss called me at 5 45 the other morning because he's <laughs> <laughs> he saw i was online which so, day though wait, wait what day was it uh, i was week? like a weekday yeah but he's like oh I see he's online. He'll answer a call. <laughs> <laughs> that will be me, I suppose, because I yeah. wake up at five every day. So I'll be Wild. like, yeah, 5.45, of course he's awake. Yeah, well, Boom. <laughs> I didn't even get it. Like we jumped on the call. It was all sweet. Okay, back to what I would do if I was starting up like some sort of media business. I would make it look as official as possible, as legitimate. You want to like build trust so that when you do talk to people, no matter where they look, it's going to be legit. So you want a basic landing page of a website with a bit of a about me, the links to the socials, any previous work you can show. Look, even if you go on like Inviter or Shutterstock or something and get some like freaking photos that you didn't even take, you can make a legit looking website in one day if you know what you're doing. Easy. Um, even for video, like you can get stock footage stock and, video. Put a, and put a video together. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's probably a bit cheeky if you don't video. <laughs> But you can do it. Yeah, you're good. Um, I would I would get the basic socials. I would probably get Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube. And then if I had the content, I would just start like putting up a bunch of stuff. You're not going to get a whole bunch of interaction when you have no followers, but you can make it look like what you're making is good so that when you meet someone out and about and say, hey, I'm from pot plant industries and they – go to freaking instagram because that's the first thing they're going to do it's going to look legit like make it look legit um and then from that stage you need to start doing lead gen um 
you're probably not going to have any money to punch into ads. So I would start by coming up with some sort of package that's easy to understand and reaching out directly to businesses locally. Um, there's How would you do the reach out? Phone number, DMs? Mm, look, I would go hard on Instagram DMs and you're going to get a pretty low success rate. I know from like Evolve, we got 80 something thousand followers. The amount of people that reach out to us trying to work with us is ludicrous. Um, but if it came in with the right pitch and it sort of made sense, I might go for it. Probably not, but other bit. <laughs> go for it. Probably not. Well, we have <laughs> we we have in-house capabilities. So yeah, yeah. So it has to be a really good concept. Yeah. yeah. What I would probably do, and I I've I might have told you this before, is I would start looking around for businesses where there's like like a hole in what they're doing and actually come and say to them, what you're doing here is wrong or not good or it's an easy win, it's low-hanging fruit, it's something you can improve pretty easily and I know I can do that for you. Um, this and, is how I can help. This is how I can help. This is how I can do it. And if you can, I mean, there's so many businesses. Like if like you look around here, we got restaurants and pubs and clothing stores and cafes and gyms like the amount of actual people that might pay you is ludicrous i wouldn't start with my rates super high at all i would just get money coming in consistently and once you have those people say they're paying you 500 dollars a day it's like oh now i'm a thousand dollars a day oh i can't pay that well either too bad too sad or i will pay that and now the one that did accept that payment is paying for the one that didn't accept that mm -hmm. and the workload's hard. So that's probably what I'd do. I, I've thought about doing like a little brand consulting thing on the side, mm -hmm. but I got too many things on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not doing that. Yeah. Because um, you have a side business at mm. the moment. What is that side business? Um, it's essentially like a, a e-commerce business, again, of delved back into the merchandise space it's a large facebook group it's got a mental health orientation um where you know we sell merchandise pretty much so it's all user generated content it's not time intensive in the sense of like doing the marketing for the business because it's a like it's a big group and it markets itself pretty well can, um, can you give a little breakdown of why do you have that group and all this stuff like uh, for mm. people that don't know about this brand. Can you even mention the brand? I probably don't want to say the actual brand, hmm. just because I'm, I'm keeping it like low key. I've only been like in partnership with with my friend for yeah, not yeah. that long, and it's one of those things. Like until I get the success in, I don't want to like talk Put about your it name that much. To it? Or is that is that oh, is I don't that know. the it's, reason? It's or? hard to explain. It's probably more of an ego thing than anything. But in case it doesn't work out. I'd, I'd rather tell you the success story in six months' time. Let's Should, put it that shouldn't way. Shouldn't you take the risk and say, like, this is what I'm doing, this is my no. brand. And there's other people. Because it's your brand now. Well, well, there's other people involved too, so mm. I don't want to take the liberty of that as well. Um, mm. But look, essentially, yeah, it's, it's this other thing. I'm I'd, I'd, um, building websites. I'm doing a lot of brand partnerships. I'm reaching out to some other big brands to mm. do actual deals with. I'm trying to work on... Um, getting paid marketing within our reach mm. um, and then we sell merchandise so there's a lot of uh, emails and different promotions and stuff like that that goes on there um, and then I'm actually dispatching so I'm sending shirts out every day as well but the reason you can generate sales from that is because like when that brand cause they, this is a like a brand that started years ago yeah and then it built like a massive facebook group it's right got, it's got a facebook group with mm. two hundred and fifty thousand people in and it's got an email list with sixty thousand people on it wow so if i send out an email it doesn't matter what i'm talking about ten thousand people are going to open it do people actually open those emails yeah, I, get I don't it. open a any right. email that comes to me that is not something that, you know, either a clear client, a project, or I don't open them. Well, so we usually, we're working on like a 40 to 50% open rate 
after I clean the list, which is really fucking high, to be honest. That is a lot. It is a lot. Usually, you'd be more at like the 20, 25 mark. Um, the click rates aren't like as high, but definitely the open rates are good. And then once you have... That's why I'm talking about lead generation so much because once you have that, that's why I took on this business and I knew it wasn't going to be that much effort because there was already that many people involved in it as a base. Like I didn't have to try and build an email list with that many people. Shit, you know, it would cost you like a million dollars to build up a list of 60,000 people, Mm. like depending on what you're doing. It's hard yakka. But once you have it, I just send an email and I make heaps of sales. Like if I had a different business or a different product or something like that, like I know like the collaborations we just did, we did one with Yeti Coolers and those guys are huge. And I sent her uh, their marketing manager. They are like the Bugattis of Eskies. Yeah, man. They're they're the duck (laughs) snots. They're so expensive. (laughs) They're so expensive and they're so good. And it was such a good fit with our demographic. And I sent her like a recap. I'm like, this is how many impressions. This is the reach. This is the... um, how many email opens and the link clicks. And I gave her all the info and she was just like, fuck, yeah, that's awesome. I'm like, I put up two posts and sent two emails. It wasn't much off my back to do that, but it's it's purely because of the group. And it's not really something you can replicate as a business because it's hard to set out to grow a brand a brand is the hardest thing to build like a business is a lot easier than a brand and this is a brand yeah will will they will there be a cap on how much you can sell since you know let's say you you're leveraging that uh, audience that you have with it right but at some point it, me being let's say i'm part of that community i already bought like three times all right can you sell to me again or are you working on getting lead generation outside that group that you already have yeah 100 percent. so that's what the yeti collaboration was to me i traded exposure to our audience in order to get a value pack they gave us two thousand dollars worth of stuff which then became an incentivized sign up to get more people on my list Mm. the only reason i did that giveaway was to get more people on my list um and then what you go from there is you talk about like the lifetime value of a customer. Mm-hmm. So that that concept, by the way, I, I, I need you to break it down because this concept changed a lot of stuff for me. I learned that this concept mm-hmm. this year, like the lifetime value of a client. Mm-hmm. Um, and it changed everything for me understanding this. Can yeah. you elaborate on that? Yeah. So th- there's a couple of metrics we're going to want to look at when we're trying to maximize like i guess revenue right lifetime value of a customer is exactly that like okay sure say in the film world they only pay you a thousand dollars every two weeks it's not like it's not like that customer that came in and did a twenty thousand dollar doco but they did that once this guy's paying a thousand bucks every two weeks for two years like the lifetime value of that guy might be $100,000 to you. Um, And then what you need to work on from there is average order value. So we already know he's worth $200,000 over the lifetime he's working with you. If we can increase that by 20% or 50%, $200,000, like it keeps going up. And then you work on the frequency. So it's easy on e-commerce because they're like buying a t-shirt, right? Mm -hmm. So... Average order value, we want him to buy a hat with it or a sticker or another T-shirt that doubles the average order. And then we want to get him back quicker so he can buy more. Um, And then we want to retain him so he's buying it for a long time to come. And that's how you turn someone that buys one forty dollars shirt into someone that has spent $2,000 with you. Yeah. And that's that's pretty much the, the play. Yeah, that, that has something that I've been focusing on this year after understanding a lot of dabbling more with business side of things and sales and all this stuff. Like understanding how much one client means to you. What's the average that you get per client, that lifetime value average per client. And let's say it's five grand, you know, you, you will do everything in your power 
to make sure that client is happy so he keeps coming back to you for more projects more mm. videos more stuff um and some of them will go further than 5k yeah. but then you also understand you know when you get one client how much does that client represents on average you mm. know like and it also goes hand in hand with like the acquisition costs so once you start mm -hmm putting a value on your lead generation, whichever way it is, if it's actual paid ads or it's networking or going and doing events, like it might cost you $50 to land a client mm -hmm. or it might cost you 45 cents to get a lead and then, you know, one in a hundred actually turns into a job. Mm -hmm. So if you're say paying 50 bucks to get a job, if that job's a thousand dollars, it's 5%. But if the lifetime value of that guy is a hundred thousand mm. dollars, the acquisition cost doesn't make so much of a worry. And then you can look at it and justify spending a lot more money on acquiring more customers because you know that you have the framework to get the longevity out of the customer to make up that cost. Yeah. Yeah. Um Beside, I, I want to go back for a second just so sort of I don't forget because I think this could help people um the times that you went through that were difficult where you know you, you told me a story where uh, you couldn't even afford a uh, gas for your car can you can you talk about mm -hmm. that after i finish this question but it's basically like what were the things that help you get through those times because as an entrepreneur regardless if you're creative or not it it is very difficult it is it, it is the hardest thing i've ever done after you know leaving my country and and actually earn my place on on a on a different country so what what are the things that help you get through those difficult moments how how if someone is listening to this and you know they they're having a they're going through a very dark period of time whether it's you know the loss of a family member or the business not generating enough money or not having enough money to pay for the rent in the next couple of weeks like what kind of advice would you give to those people yeah so the the fuel story is one that like i sort of reflect on now because it's a good end like it shows a part of my life that I'm not going back to and it was like a pretty hectic time this is back when I was making 250 bucks a week and spending 220 of it on rent so I had 30 bucks to do fuel and food and all the rest and I was trying to get to work one morning and I didn't have enough fuel to get to work to do my freaking 14 hour day so I pulled up at the servo and I've just had to like literally go through the car to find any spare change i could and i'm finding like 20 cents here and then i found like a dollar and then i found and i got up to like four dollars fifty and i put four dollars fifty of fuel in my car and then i drove to work and like it's sort of demoralizing to be like how like how am i at this stage where like i could work at maccas for 18 bucks an hour I'm coming here working on, it was like $4 an hour by the time you worked it out. Can't afford fuel. That was a very low point. How I got through that is that I didn't let myself getting down last very long at all. And I also had like, I owed quite a lot of money. So giving up, not an option. Like, like, I just didn't think I'd give up ever. Um, I'm sort of lucky in how it ended because it gave me an out. But I don't know what would have happened if I had to stay in that rut for, like, a long time because it would have either had to succeed or it would have just worn me down further and further until I had to break and fail or something like that. But, yeah... I guess you, you're going to get losses every single day. I mean, I've had like a couple days in the last two weeks where I'm like, fuck, I've taken a lot of losses today and I feel quite sad about it, but it's going to happen. Um, so, yeah, just 
the mentality of not giving up. Giving up's not an option. Just keep fucking going until the point where you know you're flogging a dead horse. We've spoken about that on some of our old podcasts. If you're doing something for five years and it's not working, it's not going to work, bro. I don't reckon. Yeah, you need, you need to be able to know when is the right time to quit. I almost say I I always say don't be a quitter. I hate quitters. Like I I generally do, <laughs> and I I do not even like the word. Like I don't even use that word. That that's not it's not a part of my vocabulary. I don't I don't like using it. I I'm it's not something I'll ever say. You know I'm quitting. I like that even sounds awful yeah. to me. But you have to know when is the right time to pivot and do something different because this is a trap that happens to a lot of entrepreneurs and people in general that they keep going down a route that literally ha- is going nowhere. It's just going downhill and you just continue to do because you don't know better or your ego is too big to to say, I I need to do something different. Like be be able to stop analyze yourself and what you're doing and where you're going that's why it's so important to be able to zoom out and look at the big picture what's the big picture you know and that that's why i will highly recommend you have a purpose and reading down um, um, a purpose mission vision because then you can always reflect and go back to okay why am i doing this thing what how am I doing it and what am I hoping to accomplish afterwards? Because you can always go back to the drawing board and be like, okay, that's my purpose. That's my mission. That's my vision. Yes, this activity actually makes sense and I need to get through this. There's no quitting. There's no going back. I will make this work. Sometimes you just have to keep pushing. Even though it might feel like really hard, it might feel like hell, you you do are it's very difficult for you to find a reason to stay in there that's just what you have to do we all have to go through hard times and hard times will just make you better will just make you smarter will make you more efficient will make you an overall a better version of yourself so just just have that that's a a thing that changed everything for me is having written down my purpose mission vision so i can always reflect back to that when things get difficult when i'm not really finding the motivation it's like wait a minute is this thing actually helping me with what i want to accomplish if the answer is no i need to be able to detach the pivot and just perform a, a, a different activity or, or just go about it in a different way. Sometimes it's just like, yep, this is what needs to be done. So I have to shut the fuck up and just keep working. You're, just yeah. keep pushing. See, even in those like super dark low moments, yeah, quitting wasn't an option. I'm lucky. I, I owed a shitload of money. So I'm like, it, it literally wasn't an option for me. I'm like, I'm probably like, there's literally no way that I wasn't, paying that back is sort of where I was. So even on the shittest, darkest days, it was like quit tomorrow. And then by the time you get to tomorrow, you're going to sort some shit out and be a little bit better and keep fucking going with it. So just no giving up. I yeah. agree. No, not giving up. Um, I, I just want to, we're approaching the end. I just want to make a question because this, I just thought about this, that it could be very helpful for content creators because you're a content creator yourself as well. Um, you, you still collaborate with brands and things like that. When people reach to companies and brands like Evolve, how are you assessing um, someone for a collaboration? If I was a content creator and I wanted to work with someone like Evolve, how how can I make that happen? What tips do you have for content creators and you know, filmmakers, photographers that w- want to work with massive brands and, and well-established uh, businesses or, or, or brands? What, what advice would you give to them? I would say understand the needs of the company you're approaching. I cannot tell you how many emails we get hey guys i'm a photographer from new york city i love your boards and it would be sick to work together to create some amazing content it's going to look great i'm like yeah that's generic as shit like i I have the pre-save response on instagram hey sorry we're not interested for collaborations right now 
unless they come to me with like, hey, this is the idea or this is the deliverables, this is what I can offer to you. And this is where I have quite a lot of success in my personal collaborations. Like I am in no way a big time influencer. I'm not like the best content creator ever. I, Like I said earlier, I'm not a filmmaker. Like I'm not a photographer. I don't know what I am. I can do those things, but I wouldn't call myself that. But most of the times when I want something, I can word it in a way to get the brands to see that I'm going to be of value to them. And that's because I understand the needs of the brand, whether they don't even know that they have that need or I, I, I don't know what they're thinking when I approach them, but it seems to work out pretty well because I put in more thought than just saying, hey, I can make content for you. Like what, what the fuck is content in 2022? Are you going to make a three-minute fucking YouTube edit or are you going to make 20 reels or are you going to take some photos? Are you going to do some EDMs? Like, like I don't know what it is. Um, yeah, and content's king too. So I think good content is more important than reach nowadays. So don't, don't stress about having a bazillion followers. Stress about... Um, producing good content that's of value to the brand and make a media kit that's the number one i think how do you make a media kit um it's a pdf document outlining who you are what you do what value you bring so mine has uh pretty much it's like a photo of me it's got like my key stats my demographics and stuff for my influence um a paragraph about who i am what i do previous people i've worked with and then it's got a page that will change based on the collaboration I'm going for. So say me and one of our friends, Patch, we did a van trip through Scandinavia early this year. I'm like, I'm not paying for a camper van. I'll, I'll do a collab with a camper van company. I just tweaked that last page to say like, this is some photos of cars I've taken and this is why it'll be a good idea for you and blah, 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 blah. But I understood like in that situation, what they actually needed wasn't pretty photos of the van. They needed like van tour videos for their YouTube. So potential clients could go on there and actually learn how to use a van. Like get a... like I, I Almost I, a tutorial. I did a tour of the van. Like I didn't even post it. Like they needed that for their YouTube. And that's more important than like a cinematic reel. You have to understand that even if it's cooler to make a cinematic reel... That's not what they needed. Mm -hmm. And if they had to pay a film production company to do that, it would cost them more than it would cost to give me the van. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, understanding the needs of the client or the person or the brand or the business that you want to work with, it's what's going to change everything and, and even allow you that opportunity to work with them. If you understand their needs, you will be able to deliver their dream outcome. Um, I'm, I'm just realizing you're a brand manager. I mm. didn't even ask you, what's a brand, Matty? What's a brand? What's a brand? Yes. How do mm. we define brand? The difference between days? brand and a business. It's a good question. You could probably Google it and get a better answer than what I'm going to give you. I think a brand is something that you can emotionally relate to. So like when you say Apple, you understand what Apple's like values are, like what they're trying to achieve, what they're doing. Um, same with like Yeti, like you said, like you know that it's about being super rugged and quality and like that sort of stuff. That's a brand that they've built up over a lot of time. They've built a reputation attached to a name. And then in that sense, they have products to back it up, but sometimes... Um, you're building a brand name and the products is almost secondary. So, yeah, that's what, that's what a brand is. Brand sells more than anything. That's why Kylie Jenner can sell anything she wants because of the brand attached to it. Can you build a fake brand? Um, you can build a fake brand. Yeah. Well, what is a fake brand? I think the minute someone relates to a brand, even if you built it to be fake, if they've related to your fake brand and actually purchased something, it's not a fake brand. It's just the brand that you... Half of, <laughs> half of that's fake, but people obviously like it. So it's a real brand as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. 
Yeah, nice. Um, just to wrap things up, um, if you could give any advice to the young Matty, the young Matty boy, the one that was getting after it, the one that had four point five dollars to pay for petrol. What kind of advice would you give to him or any other entrepreneur, um, young entrepreneur or someone that is just getting started? What what kind of advice would you give? Um, be better than you were yesterday. It's all going to work out eventually. And you're still not going to know exactly what you're doing in the future. And it's fine. Yeah. Because I, I still feel all over the shot. Like I'm at the stage now where I don't have to stress too much about putting fuel in my car. But like in terms of like, I don't know what, what my career is going to be doing in 10 years. Not a fucking clue. Like there's not like a linear progression for someone like me. It's not like my wife's a pharmacist. She's going to be a pharmacist in 10 years. Almost guarantee that. Am I going to be a brand manager, a graphic designer, a campaign manager? Am I going to have my own branding consulting firm? Am I going to have a fucking film production? I don't know. <laughs> And I think that's okay. Um, as long as you're being better than you used to be. Yeah, I think it's fine. I really like the last one as well. Yeah, that you got to be fine with the unknown. Yeah, yeah. you got to be become familiar with it especially as an entrepreneur or as a, as as a someone that is trying to make things happen and building something from the ground up you got to be understanding that anything could happen and that's the magic of it because when anything can happen anything is possible that's it like who knows what's going to happen like the skateboards could blow up and we just go crazy there this other thing i'm going like this could turn into a massive like mental health thing and my whole vocation could be, become mental health like mm -hmm. i could build that up and then sell it and then go on to something completely new i mean and the time frame that this can happen too that's the other thing i'd say my life turned around really freaking quickly from having almost no money to buying a house and not having to worry about not like i'm rich or anything but like I don't have to worry about it for like paying insurance on my car and getting groceries every week and paying rent. Like that's all sorted. That all happened in like a year from like having fuck all <laughs> to being sorted. Um, and then after doing that for like four years, it's like, okay, now like I'm a lot more secure. So it can turn around a lot quicker than people would expect if you get in the right situation. Never underestimate how quickly things can change. That's something I try to remind mm. myself consistently because things can go bad very quickly, but they can also go well as fast. Man, it was shocking how fast it turned around, to be honest with you. That's, yeah, definitely one of the most exciting and um, unexpected things that's happened in my career how quickly things got okay is there anything else that you will want to say mm. to entrepreneurs or creatives or anyone yeah so in the creative realm i think it's important to be multi-skilled um especially nowadays and i i think it's hard to explain but there's so much um scope for what a person like me is able to do and like i know you're the same like there's there's a whole bunch of stuff that you could do if it came to it if you had to go and get a job say and you went on seek you could get a job as a photographer or a filmmaker but you don't even know it you've been building your skills in in brand and marketing just because you're learning how to pitch to these clients what they actually need to build their brand mm -hmm. so you can do that as well so building up these Um, nest of skills and then figuring out which way to apply it to whatever business or job that you're trying to get is going to be really important going forward because I don't think there's going to be many people that can get away with being just a filmmaker like it's just not good enough 
Yeah, in, for sure. in my position, unless you're like in Hollywood actually making proper films, if you're trying to be a creative agency, like why not take people's money for the film and then the photos and then the graphics design? Why not get into some digital marketing once you have the resources and the understanding to make it work? Yeah, and elaborating on that, I think even more importantly is learning besides your actual skill, like learning almost like the different realms of it, you know, whether is it, you know, within videography, the different types of videography that you can find, adjacent skills like photography or design or, or website development, whatever it is, but sales and marketing and negotiation are huge. The business side is this big. The business side of things. Yeah, and that's what really probably turned it around for me a little bit is like getting that shit together um and I, I remember saying this to you for a long time mm -hmm. i'm like stop buying freaking gear stop reading books stop like practicing how to make films you're good enough and you have enough gear get to the business like fucking make it work and when you finally did that it did start working. <laughs> yeah, it did. It did. And it's hard because I, I, and now I see it clearly. Yeah. Like now I'm like, holy shit. Okay. Like you didn't I, need another lens. <laughs> I didn't need another lens. I didn't need it to watch another tutorial and didn't need it to make my videos 0.5% better. I needed to learn how to self my abilities, my skills and how to communicate value to my client. That's what I needed to do. How do I translate the things that I'm able to do to my client and how I will help them to achieve their dream outcome. How would I alleviate their pain and how can I help them get quicker to where they want to be? How yeah. can I sell the destination and not the travel? You yeah. Know? And that's, it's so important, man, that communication. And that's probably like the, the one piece of advice I'd give you to like even hone in even further is increase your understanding of what a business in 2023 needs because it's changed like mm. the social platforms it's all changed like no one needs that many big videos mm. so really like have a look at what kind of businesses you're working with and what you can do to alter the pitch to give them value mm -hmm. based mm. on what they actually need not what you know you would like to make i think that'd be your 2023. Yes. And speaking of value, we'll have a great podcast from uh, upcoming guest about value, value-based pricing, most likely. So I'll just leave it at that. But Mari Boy, thank you so much for coming to the podcast with no name for now. <laughs> if people want to find you and learn more about you, where, where can they do it? I'm a guy called Matty on instagram um maddie rogers on linkedin linkedin's coming back mate yeah yeah i know i uh, saw you there you saw we're me? connected we're yeah. connected <laughs> um yeah that's that's pretty much it a guy called maddie on instagram i don't do too much personally i spend all my time building other people's brands yeah, yeah. awesome well uh, thanks for everyone listening uh, there will be links or something to follow but i will see you on the next episode goodbyes for everyone of a podcast with no name thanks guys that's with no name <laughs>